Year 7, Macbeth. Now, I'm sorry, apologies for the row behind me, I've had to come out the doors to get a better internet signal. Because it doesn't allow me to play. So, let's start the lesson. You need to know what a tyrant, or you need to remember what a tyrant is, because somebody later on refers to Macbeth as such. So, let me remind you, a tyrant is somebody who takes a throne by illegal means and governs in a bullying, dictatorial, sort of uncompromising, strict way. And how has Macbeth demonstrated tyranny so far in play? Okay, let's jump over to antithesis. This important concept comes up whenever you read Shakespeare, really. So remember what antithesis is, write down the definition, and make some by filling in the gaps. Macbeth is a low person in a, in a what place? And Lady Macbeth, remember her with her artful, calculating, dagger concealing and murderous impulses. Lady Macbeth is a beautiful woman with what? Remember, anti thesis. Anti means opposite. Let's look at hubris now, because later on, Macbeth is going to demonstrate hubris. It is dangerous overconfidence. And it's a familiar concept in Greek drama. In Greek, it means excessive pride towards or defiance of the gods. Um, you've read the Odyssey, you've read the Iliad. Characters in those stories need to be need to have the gods favor they lose the gods favor if they offend the gods by being proud or arrogant and they usually have to make some sort of sacrifice family members are the sacrifice of choice usually for gods um so which is a synonym for hubris then love or arrogance and let's aim high which one of these is similar to hubris and why? Tyranny, bravery, or politeness? Today we're going to advance two whole scenes. We're going to look at some specific quotations from a witch called Hecate's speech. And we're going to look at some context we know about her to a personal interpretation of scene five. So basically, some comprehension questions on scene five. Words. Hecate basically gives the other three witches a lecture. He, she tells them off, introducing them as beldams, meaning hags. I think this is actually Shakespeare being ironic. They are, they are dams, but they're not bell, meaning beautiful. Saucy means disobedient. The witches have done some unauthorized activity. She, Hecate, says that the she's a contri she's the contriver she's the one who decides decides what to do she says our art our powers uh should have a better opportunity to shine under her guidance she calls macbeth a waste of time he's a wayward person spoils he's selfish he acts towards his own ends he does what he wants so she commands them to collect their vessels pots and cauldrons and to meet tomorrow. Meanwhile, she's going up to collect an important drop, a vaporous drop from the moon. And then the witches together, when Macbeth joins them, are going to make magic slights to conjure three artificial sprites or spirits. So uh, you have the text and you'll be able to answer these questions with it. Them now, so you can either go straight to the video summary or or the text. So, uh, why is Hecate angry with the witches? Question two: How does Hecate feel about Macbeth? Three: Where should the witches meet in the morning? Four: Who will come to meet the witches in the morning? How is Hecate going to spend the night? What's she going to harvest to create a spell? What will Hecate's spell do to Macbeth? Question eight, what's man's biggest weakness according to Hecate? I'll give you a clue to the answer to question nine. What's interesting about the form of Hecate's speech? Well, remember Shakespeare presents witch's speech in a particular way. 
it's always recognizable as a witch speech or fairy speech. So what is it about it that's uh, so unusual? Okay, let's push on to talking a little about Hecate. So she was the goddess of witchcraft and Greek myth, also the goddess of the moon. You'll notice she has three bodies there. The witches uh, often speak in lists of three, because three is the number of the devil, according to folklore. Um, she carries two torches that light her way through the underworld. Hecate, you'll read and possibly hear, refers to Acheron, which is the uh, one of the principal rivers. It's the principal river in the underworld. Uh, souls cross it to reach Hades or hell. Um, her familiars include a dog, a polecat or owl. Interestingly, Macbeth is referred to as an owl in Macbeth possibly because they hunt at night. Uh, yeah, she has three bodies. Okay, so we're, the audience watching this was uh, an, an audience of superstition. Uh, they would be familiar with witches and conjuring. Witches would, or women, these herbalists, local herbalists, would use um, charms such as herbs and berries and so on to make remedies. Shakespeare satirizes these spells by having his witches create charms or spells out of some appalling um, ingredients such as um, snakes, fillets, um, gallbladders and um, tongues and other unsavory details. video summary no not yet let's jump over to scene six because i need to leave you with where lennox is as well so let's jump out of where Macduff is sorry let's jump over to edge quickly i won't read scene five with you that's in the summary you have all the language to access it um, but let me just remind you, Lennox was one of the guests at Macbeth's dinner. Uh, he remarks that Malcolm and Donald Bane and Fleance have all left the scene. He accuses them of killing their father and then fleeing. He's quite complimentary initially towards Macbeth and uh, saying that Macbeth, in pious rage, in loyal rage, slaughtered the two delinquent guards while uh, Duncan slept, while they, while they slept, the slaves, slaves would drink, when really Lady Macbeth had drugged them. Then he changes his tune a little later to say that Fleance escaped because he failed his presence at the tyrant's feast. So he failed his presence at the tyrant's feast. So... I should, sorry, I should say Macduff is in disgrace because he failed his presence at the Tyrant's Feast. He didn't show up at Macbeth's dinner. And really, Macduff is feeling aggressive towards Macbeth, distrustful towards Macbeth. He's actually fled to England. So, the Lord. Is it Lennox called Macbeth a tyrant? On. Now, the Lord says, reports that... The, the, the tyrant has taken over Duncan's crown and Macduff lives in the English courts now so he's over in exile with Malcolm and he wants to wake this chap called Northumberland, the Duke of Northumberland to come back to Scotland so in short Macduff is in England with Malcolm and Lennox says well Let's hope an angel brings them back from England so that we can, they can relieve our suffering country, which is under a cursed hand. Who's, whose hand is the cursed hand? It's Macbeth's. So Macduff is feeling vengeful over in England. Um, now, carefully, I must go back to the video summary so you can answer your questions. Let me include system audio. That's a PowerPoint. I'll meet you on the other side of this.
students, welcome to the Heath. At the end of last video, you'll remember that Macbeth promised to pay another visit to the Weird Sisters because he wants to know what his future has in store. He wants to know the worst. Um, now, this video is not for the faint-hearted because uh, we're going to talk about the unsavoury business of charms. In this scene, you're going to be introduced to a witch called Hecate. We've seen three witches so far, but there's actually a fourth who's the head of all of them. And she is going to explain that she's going to go up to the moon, collect some ingredients, uh, which forms part of a charm. So before we look at that, I'm going to explain how a charm was made. Because when medical science failed, um, local women with local ingredients would succeed. Students, here we are, another part of the heath. Um, here's a pot into which witches would uh, add various ingredients for making a charm or a spell. So, as I say, natural ingredients would allow local women to prove they have an advantage over medical science for unexplained injuries or illnesses. So, what we could add from the local environment is a bit of head of elder there, some elder flower. I'm wearing some rubber gloves because it's a very unsavoury business we're about to get into. There's a bit more elder here. This is, if anyone's ever read The Monster Calls, you'll recognise the tree, the yew tree. It actually had magical, they're very old trees. They had, they're said to have had magical properties. So there's some yew branches here. Here's, uh, these are fox gloves, I believe. I think they're poisonous as well. And um, there's something called deadly nightshade around. Where is it? These purple flowers here. So they're going in. Belladonna would be an ingredient. Don't have any of that. These are bird cherries we'll have to do. And uh, just the remnants of the yew and the fox clubs. Let's go and collect some dead animals next. Students, welcome to a different part of the heath. Now, this is a pile of horse dung. Uh, it was said that if naughty boys, if naughty boys uh, played a practical joke on you by defecating in front of your door, um, a charm or a spell would involve taking part of the, the feces that they left behind and placing a poker, stabbing it with a poker, and that would cause the naughty boy pain wherever he, wherever he, uh, wherever he got to. Um, so again, these natural local ingredients could be used to form part of the witch's charm or spell. Uh, in fact, I tell you what, let's grab a bit of the manure and add it to our charm. So students, we have in our cauldron, the nightshade, the foxglove, the dung, and some other herbs. Um, all that needs to be added is the dead animals, I think. So, um, look away now if you, well, if you, if you're, if you're a t trifle squeamish, because I have a dead duckling and uh, a mummified hen. Now, it said there were two local women in 1604 who claimed that part of their remedy for illnesses was to place a duck's bill into the mouth of the of the sick person to as part of their charm. Uh, we are just going to put the whole duck into the cauldron. So um, let's just empty the ingredients. Here we go. This is the this is going to the poor duckling. It's very dead. Toss that inside. And here is the mummified hen been dug up recently by a pair of dogs I believe so we'll add that into as well into the charm as well so that is all we need and Hecate uses slightly more uh, slightly more savory ingredients she is the head witch she's going all the way to the moon to collect a bit of dew in the following scene but first she's going to tell the witches off for 
toying with Macbeth without her. Have I not reason, Beldams, as you are, saucy and overbold? How did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth in riddles and affairs of death? And I, the mistress of your charms, the close contriver of all harms, was never called to bear my part or show the glory of our art. And, which is worse, all you have done hath been but for a wayward son, spiteful and wrathful, who, as others do, loves for his own ends, not for you. But make amends now, get you gone, and at the pit of Acheron <laughs> meet me the morning. Thither he will come to know his destiny. Your vessels and your spells provide, your charms and everything beside. I am for the air, this night I'll spend unto a dismal and a fatal end. Great business must be wrought ere noon upon the corner of the moon. There hangs a vaporous drop profound. I'll catch it ere it come to ground. And that distilled by magic slights shall raise such artificial sprites as by the strength of their illusion shall draw him on to his confusion. He shall spurn fate, scorn death, and bear, he hopes, above wisdom, grace, and fear. And you all know security is mortal's chiefest enemy. Hark, I'm called, my little spirit, see, sits on a foggy cloud and stays for me. Okay, um, I use some artistic license there, let's face it. Uh, directors often interpret Macbeth in different strange ways. Part of the beauty of watching Shakespeare is that some directors are extremely creative. Um, yeah, Hecate doesn't drive, let alone a, an Aston Martin DB9. So uh, apologies for the dead duck. No animals were harmed during the making of the video. So those questions again. Uh, pause the video if you need to. Why is Hecate angry with the witches? How does Hecate feel about Macbeth? Where should the witches meet in the morning? Who will come to meet the witches in the morning? Why? How is Hecate going to spend the night? What's she going to harvest to create the spell? What will Hecate's spell do to Macbeth? What is man's biggest weakness according to Hecate? And comment on the structure of the speech. What is interesting about the form of it? Final two questions. Who calls Macbeth a tyrant at the end of scene six? What could and on hubris, what quotation of Hecate's shows Macbeth is going to show hubris later when they meet? So, a host of questions, but you'll know a lot more about Macbeth. See you next week. <laughs>